One of the big questions in history has been, how did the church, how did the church that started so small with, with this um, Galilean rabbi gathering disciples together and, and living out in this rural area, how did this, this church that started out so small and, and had no political power, had no political influence, they, they had no money, they had no, no, no people with, with big resources that were able to help them, how did this, how did this church that started so very small, explode and, and grow and, and have such an impact around the whole world. Well, one of the reasons that we, we know that this happened, historians tell us, as they've gone back to study, they've, they've recognized that, that during the time when, when Jesus lived in the early church, that one of the common practices was infanticide. And so um, the early church uh, saw this was taking place where where somebody would have a child and they, they didn't want to have another mouth to feed and so they would actually take the baby outside the city and they had a designated area where they would just leave the child. And so if somebody wanted to come along and uh, you know, rescue that child, they could do so. They could you know, bring him into their family or, or what typically happened was uh, slave traders uh, would, would take these children and raise them up and, and sex trafficking, you know, the, the whole sort of thing. That was a common use of the day. And the church saw that that was going on and they said, hey, that's not right. Every, every person who is, is, is created by God and, and every person has value because God created them and, and nobody is an accident and nobody's here uh, without God's hand. And so the church said, we need to do something about it. And so they didn't just condemn that practice, but they actually went out there and began to rescue these babies and bringing them into their own homes. Now, the early church was, was filled with a bunch of people who were, were slaves themselves or, or poor people themselves or, or widows themselves. And, and so they didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have a lot of resources. And so the world took note of what was going on. How these, chit, how these Christians were responding to these unwanted babies that were left out to die, left, left for the animals or whoever to come along and get them. And the church responded that way and it made an impact. But also the, the church gained influence because they were ones who would welcome in widows. Women were considered, you know, throughout most of the, the world, second-class citizens. You know, they weren't on the same level as, as men. And so uh, when a woman was widowed, you didn't have, you know, Social Security, didn't have uh, the state to provide assistance. And so they were left out there on their own. And the church began to bring them in to their, their family and said, come on, come join us. We don't have a lot, but we're going to share with you what we have. And again, that made an impact. On, on the world. The world looked around and said, why are they doing this? Why are the Christians acting like this? Why are they responding this way? And we saw over and over again how, how these kinds of acts of, of service made an impact in the world that the church was formed and, and the church took off. So it starts out with, with Jesus and 11 disciples because one betrayed Jesus and it explodes in growth and spreads across the entire Roman Empire until it it moved from being an illegal religion to becoming the official religion of the empire. The early church was attractive, and God blessed them, and they grew as a result of that. And, and I think when we read this passage of Scripture, we can see how, how God, when He blesses a soil, when He blesses a soil and, and the seed, that it, it is fruitful and it multiplies. And this is part of God's plan. This is part of God's work. Now, I've never been to Israel, and some of you have been to Israel before. Um, but here's a little map that kind of gives you an idea. On the northern coast of Galilee, you can see the city of Capernaum, and that's kind of where, where one of the big hubs, fishing hub there, and, and where Jesus would, would uh, have his ministry sort of out of that area. And then to the southwest, there's an area called the Sower's Cove. And that Sower's Cove is, is where many people speculate where Jesus shared this parable that we just had read a little bit ago. So we don't know because nobody put a plaque up for us to tell us that that's where it was. But, but we kind of suspect that that's probably uh, a good possibility because 
there's sort of a natural amphitheater there. As you can kind of see, if Jesus gets in the boat and, and moves out to the water, the people on the shore, on the side, can, can hear his, his voice being projected out and bouncing off the water and up to them. And so I thought it was kind of interesting. There was a, um, several things on the Internet that you can, you can find anything on the Internet, but there were people who would sit way up at the top and, and somebody else out in the water just a little ways would begin to speak and the people way up high could hear them speaking. And so there are some examples of that given on, online that you could see. But, but undoubtedly, Jesus knew that this was, a, you know, how this would help his voice. And, and as this large crowd came in, that they could hear what he had to say. And he began to talk to them about, you know, this, the different soils. Now, sometimes we refer to this as the parable of the sower. Um, but I think it probably should be more more accurately described as the parable of the soil. Because what Jesus here describes is the soil. I had a professor uh, when I was in seminary that he called Adam and Eve, you know Adam and Eve, he called Adam the original dirtbag. <laughs> and, and it goes back to the fact that when God created man, he, he took up some dust of the ground, he took some dirt off the ground and said, here and he formed Adam and Eve in in God's own image, right? And so, so we are connected to dirt, is what I want to say. I want to make this, you know, from the beginning we have a connection with dirt. And so, when Jesus is talking about the soils, he's not really locked into just um, particular kinds of soil as much as he's trying to make a connection with us, because we are soil. And I think we'll see that as we look at this parable just a little bit. So here is, here is um, Jesus given these four different soils, the path, the rocky places, the thorns, the good soil. And as I mentioned before, he starts out with the parable with listen, and he ends with whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, as a few months ago, I, I was reading uh, a book, I believe, and, and it talked about the new love language. And the new love language is listen. And I thought, that's pretty good. And then I was reading another book. Um, I think it was uh, Positively Irritating. And I was reading that book, and he, he kind of said the same thing. And, and I thought, that's really good. I, I wonder who said that. And I wasn't able to, to find who it was who made that original statement. But I, I thought, I'm going to steal it myself. I don't know who said it, but I'm going to take it as my own. Um, one of the love languages that we have is to listen. When we listen, when we take time to, to listen to a spouse or we listen to a child or we listen to our neighbor, we're, we're expressing love to them and that, that we're giving them our time to, to hear them, to hear what they have to say. And certainly when it comes to God, we want to take time to listen to him, right? To hear what he has to say. Our culture is not a culture of listening, and we've got a bajillion podcasts and, and music and everything's available on these crazy phones that we have. But we don't listen real well. In fact, you see a lot of the, the television programs and, and I'm kind of a news junkie, so I like to see what's going on in the world. And as, as I'm watching the news, they'll, they'll bring on a guest a lot of times and they'll, they'll ask this guest, you know, what his thoughts or what his opinions are. But they don't really listen to him. You know, they just got a few seconds and they start talking over them. And I said, what, you know, this annoys me. And, and so Stephanie, so how come you don't listen to that? How come you don't watch that show anymore? Ah, I get tired of, they just talk over each other. And I'm not, I'm not interested in that. And, but that, that's how a lot of us do as well. When we're having a conversation, if I'm talking to, to uh, Jim and Jan and, and they're talking to me and, and they start to tell me about a vacation they took and then I interrupt them and I tell them about my vacation. You know, I just can't wait to listen. I want to tell them what, I, what happened, what I experienced. And we're pretty good at that, talking over one another and not listening. But I think certainly Jesus wants to make a point that you need to listen. Listen to what I have to say here. Now, he talks about these different soils. And the fields in in the Middle East and Israel were a little different than the fields that I'm used to in Kansas. A family would own a particular plot of ground and, and this ground would be marked off by 
by stone. They have markers that would, would uh, designate this is, this is your property, and on the other side of this rock is your neighbor's property, and, the other, and, and that's the way they would separate those fields out. Now, the farmers would not plow up the soil like, like we would do in Kansas. You know, I, I've driven you know, tractors like that one where we, we go out into the field and we're, we're breaking up the, the ground. We're, we're, we're trying to work over the stubble from last year's crop and, and we're trying to, to kill all the weeds that might have sprouted up. It's amazing how weeds grow so easily. Uh, but we're trying to kill up all those weeds. And, and so we'd plow over the ground before we would plant the seed. And when we would plant the seed, we'd use a drill like this. And that drill would, would put the seed down in the ground. And as it would go through, it would sort of cover up the seed in, in the ground. Well, in the Middle East, they would, they would farm a little differently. They would go out into the field and they would just broadcast the seed everywhere. And then they would go back and, and maybe... Uh, brush some dirt or scrape a little bit of dirt over top of the seed and allow it to take take hold there. So it's a little bit different style of farming than what I'm used to, but in Mark's gospel, it tells us that there's a variety of harvests, some that, that produce 30 and some 60 and some even 100. Luke's gospel only talks about 100. And one of the things that we find in the scriptures, when Jesus has given us a number, when he's telling us something that we, we need to recognize that he doesn't give us a bunch of extra irrelevant material. He's telling us stuff that's important. And a lot of times when, when we see a number like a hundredfold, that doesn't mean much to us. But if we're familiar with the scriptures, then it should draw us back to, oh yeah, I know where that number comes from. And so you maybe think of those hearers might have been hearing Jesus when he was talking about a hundredfold increase, they might have been thinking about Genesis 26, 12, where Isaac planted crops in the land and, and that same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. So as the sower is sowing the seed, the good soil, there's only one good soil, right? The good soil produces a harvest. So does Isaac have any responsibility in the crop? Of course he does, right? He's, he's got to work. Now we recognize that God blesses the crop and that's what brought the increase. But ultimately, Isaac had to do something besides sit on his backside and watch television. He had to get out there and go and, and work the ground. He had to get out and sow the seed. He had to get out and do something in order for God to bless him. It's called a cooperation. That's how God works with us. Now we pray to God, but he expects us to cooperate with him. So as we are praying to God, God, would you move? God, would you help? God, would you, would you send forth you know, the gospel into my neighborhood, to my neighbor? Would you help my family member that's not right with you? However we're praying, God expects us to respond and to do our part. <clears throat> so it's a partnership that we have with God. This is how God created this world that we live in. And it's what God expects us to be partners with him, co-laborers with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is a privilege for us. Not many amens, but um, believe me, it's a privilege for us to be, be a part of that opportunity we have. So Isaac has a responsibility. As God is broadcasting the seed, he's the sower. As he's putting out the seed, he's sowing seed in our lives. And we, we heard you know, Stacy's testimony how God was working in her life, even though she had some other bad stuff that was going on, God was still working in her life. And God was able to communicate to her that he loves her in the midst of all the junk that was going on in her life. And that's the way God is working right now in this world we live in. It may look like your neighbor, God's not doing anything in his life. He looks like he's just resistant to God and the things of God, but God's working there. And we need to cooperate with God and partner with God to be the hands and feet so that we can help whenever we have opportunity. Well, as God's broadcasting the seed, the preparations that, that the farmer in Jesus' day would make are a little bit different than, than farmers in Kansas. 
I was hired out to go and, and plow the fields a lot of times, but the farmers in Jesus' day would simply burn off the fields. They'd light them on fire and burn them off. And, and in Kansas, they do burn off some of the fields as well, trying to save a little bit of money if they can save some money and try to do the no-till farming and that sort of thing. Um, but there's preparation that needs to be made. Um, burn off the thorns, get rid of the weeds, and then secondly, to remove the rocks out of the fields. And as you find a new rock, you pile it up on the boundary marker, right? You put it to use, but you get it out of the field. Now, when my uncle had uh, hired me to, to farm some fields, there were some fields that we've not worked for, for a number of years. And so when I was going out there, I would I'd come across these rocks in a rocky area. And he taught me to raise the the, the disc up because I didn't want to tear the disc up by going over those rocks. And if I'd see a large rock, you know, to stop and get out and move that rock out of the way or go back and get it later. Um, don't leave that big rock there because it's going to tear up the implement. So what I discovered was I could work the field one year and the very next year I would go out in that field and I'd find new rocks that weren't there last year. And I think, how did that happen? But that's how the, it works in the, in the fields, that these rocks will work themselves up over time. And that's kind of how it works in our life as well. We have these rocks that, that over time, we think we've got it all clean, we're all in good shape, we're ready to go. But over time, we see new rocks appear, new things that we need to work out and we need to deal with. I think when, when Jesus is telling this parable that I think the hearers, might have been thinking of a couple of the prophets. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12 says, Sow righteousness for yourselves, reap the fruit of unfailing love, and break up your unplowed ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. We have a responsibility to break up the unplowed ground, to seek after God. That's what it means to seek after God is to break up the unplowed ground. Maybe there's some areas in our life that we've not dealt with. And God wants us to, to break up that ground and let him do a work in us. Let him sow some seed in us to, to bear some fruit. Another passage I think that, that the hearers might have thought of was from Jeremiah. Jeremiah 4 verses 3 and 4. This is what the Lord says to the people of Judah and to Jerusalem. Break up your unplowed ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts and you people of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem or my wrath will flare up and burn like fire because the evil you have done. Burn with no one to quench it. See, God wants to sow some seed in our heart in the ground that we have. In the soil that we have. God wants to sow seed that will bear fruit. But if, but if we've got hardened hearts filled with rocks and weeds. If we've got lives that are, that are filled with past hurts and, and brokenness. Then God's not going to be able to bear any fruit when he sows his seed in our heart and our life. We've got to deal with some of that stuff first in order for God to bless us. And for us to be fruitful and to multiply 30, 60, 100 times. So in these passages, I think God's trying to give the people a bit of a wake-up call. These prophets are calling out to God, calling out to God's people to seek the Lord. You guys need to listen. You need to seek the Lord. You need to break up your ground. You need to get rid of those rocks out of your life. You need to, you need to deal with the weeds that you've got going on in your heart and your life. And clearly the soil represents our hearts. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart, right? Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do. Everything you do flows from your heart, from your life. It's going to flow out. So if you, if you are kind and gentle, merciful, quick to forgive... That comes not by accident. That comes from a heart that's been sown in some seed that's bearing fruit and allowing you to produce that kind of a life. 
If, if you find yourself angry and, and blowing up and getting upset over the, every little thing, you need to do some work in your heart because out of your heart is, is what's coming, that anger and that hurt and that bitterness and resentment. So guard your heart above all else. Everything you do flows from it. So my question is pretty simple this morning. What kind of soil is your heart? What kind of soil is your heart? Remember, once you go over the fields and you think you've got all the rocks removed and everything's taken care of, don't think you're done. There's more work to do. And there's going to be more work to do. And there'll be more work to do. Those weeds have an amazing way of just sprouting up, even though you never plant them. They keep coming back. And the rocks keep appearing up in the soil year after year after year. You've got to constantly be working those rocks and and weeds out of your life. So what's preventing you from receiving the Word of God and producing a bountiful harvest? What's preventing you from being fruitful? And multiplying. Sometimes we need help. So sometimes I encourage people uh, to pray. You know, this is, this is one of the things that I find just amazing because it's so simple and it's something that, that is so true for me. When I go to God in prayer, and when I was a, when I was a young boy, <laughs> you know, I always, always say that and I think of a Disney tune, um, when I was a young mortog. Um, <clears throat> you, that's a family joke that we have. There's a song, a Disney song. Um, and is it Pumbaa? Is, is it he the one that says it? War, who's the warthog? Uh, anyway, so when I was a young warthog, um, I was taught to pray. You know, a simple prayer. You know, God, show me. Show me what's in here. God, if there's something wrong in my heart, if there's something wrong in my life, then, then show me so that I can deal with it. And you know, when I was young, God would show me stuff every time I'd pray that. And I thought, you know, that's, that's one of the prayers. Every time I pray it, God answers it. <laughs> All right, God, that's enough. <laughs> but I can pray it even today. Now that I'm an old gray warthog, losing my hair, I can still pray that same prayer. God, is there something in my life that needs to go? Is there something that needs to be removed? Is there some weeds in my life? Is there some hurt in my life that I need to deal with and I need to address? When I pray that prayer, even today, God will answer that and show me. Sometimes we need help. We need God to show us. And sometimes when I would run across a rock out in the field, I'd, all I could do, because it was so big, I couldn't move it myself. I'd just raise up the disc and go over it and, and then lower the disc and keep on plowing. And then I'd have to go back and tell my uncle, this thing's too big. I need some help. And then we would determine, are we either just going to go around it or are we going to remove this thing and get rid of it? Sometimes I, you need help to deal with some of the things that are in our heart, in our life. We can't do it by ourselves. And so... I know that's not the American way, right? The American way is rugged independence, individualism. We can do it. We don't need anybody else. But that's not God's way. God gives us brothers and sisters in Christ to help us. Jesus starts off this parable with listen, and he ends this parable with whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. We've been talking about reading through the Gospels, reading these Gospels and allowing God, God's word to be sown in our heart be sown in our life. And so as we read the Gospels, each day as we we take one chapter, before we start reading, I encourage people to stop and pray. Ask God to help you because, again, one of my professors stuck in my, my head, this book's too difficult to handle it by yourself. You need help. We need God's help because it's a spiritual book. And we need God's Holy Spirit to communicate to us and help us understand it and to apply it and to put it into practice. And so we pray, Father, help me. Help me to understand this. Then help me to obey what I see, what what I hear from you. Help me to stop maybe doing something and start doing 
the right thing. Help me to see the rocks in my heart. And then God, bring along some, some brothers and sisters who can come alongside me and encourage me to continue doing what I know to do. It's a simple message. Listen and prepare your heart to receive the seed that God wants to sow in your life so that we can be fruitful and we can multiply. But God help us. God help us to know our heart and to know the rocks that need to be removed. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. I'm going to pray a prayer and then we'll be dismissed, but I want to encourage you uh, before you walk out the doors to, to take a moment, if there's somebody that you haven't had an opportunity to meet, um, take, a, take a moment if you've not met somebody um, to say hello and introduce yourself and, and take this word with you as we go out into the world that we can be the kind of soil that God wants us to be. Father, we give you thanks that you want to speak to us that you want us to hear you. Help us to slow down enough to listen. To show you how that we love you by taking time to listen to you. Help us not to talk over you. Help us not to run to jump to our own conclusions. But help us to hear you through your Holy Spirit speak to us. What needs to change in my life? What needs to be removed in my heart? Father, I pray for, for this church. Even though we're not large in number, even though we don't have a lot of, of worldly power or wealth, we know that you can take us and you can use us to be fruitful and multiply in this community and around the world. For we can have the same kind of impact that we saw the early church have. So Father, I pray that, that we would walk by faith and move by faith. Trusting you to bring the harvest. As you sow the seed in our lives. Go with us now as we leave this place. May we go forth with ears to hear. And to obey. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.